Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you are connecting from today. My name is Unherid Lang. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. Uh, I'm very pleased to be serving once again as co-host for this sixth and final session in the learning stream on humanitarian financing, which has been jointly organized by ICVA and PHAP. Today's session focuses on the grand bargain policy process. We'll begin with a brief introduction uh, by my colleague and co-host Melissa Patati from ICVA. And uh, after that, we will move to look uh, in depth at three specific areas of the grand bargain and specifically their implications for NGOs. So now getting uh, to the substance of today's session entitled Grand Bargain and its Impact for NGOs. Over the last months, as many of you know, PHAP and ICFA have organized a series of five interactive online sessions which have dealt with different funding sources available to humanitarian NGOs. Uh, everything from UN humanitarian funding to pooled funds, direct access to funding from governmental donors, as well as the growing potential of private funding in the humanitarian sector. Throughout these five events, and given the interest expressed uh, in the specific topic of the grand bargain uh, by participants uh, in past events, today we'll be exploring the development and the implications of the grand bargain, uh, which is a package of commitments made by, by different humanitarian actors to improve humanitarian financing following 10 work streams. Uh, of those 10, we'll be focusing in depth on three specific work streams, uh, namely localization, reporting, and the nexus with development. And again, that's based on the interests expressed by participants in the previous events. So therefore, uh, in brief, the learning objectives that we've laid out for today's session are as follows. Uh, first, to look at uh, what is uh, the so-called grand bargain, the main uh, processes and their origins, as well as the actors involved. Uh, and then to move into three, as I mentioned, specific aspects uh, that have been of interest. So first, uh, looking at current trends and emerging policies in relation to increasing support to national and local responders. Second, uh, the challenges faced by NGOs regarding the harmonization and simplification of reporting vis-a-vis -vis donors. And finally, uh, current discussions relating to the humanitarian development nexus and its implications for humanitarian planning and funding. And joining us today, uh, very pleased uh, to say we have a panel of three guest experts who have been heavily involved in these three specific work streams. Um, first of all, um, I am very pleased to introduce and welcome Anne Street, who's been head of humanitarian policy at CAFOD since 2010. Anne's work addresses a range of issues, including international humanitarian system change, promotion of partnership approaches and the localization of humanitarian aid, as well as advocacy on specific country crises. Anne is a strong advocate of the NGO-led Charter for Change, which is an initiative aiming to strengthen localization in the humanitarian sector. Next, Jeremy Rempel has spent this pa the past 17 years working on issues related to risk and accountability with a particular focus on NGO monitoring and evaluation systems. His current work with ICVA as a US-based consultant is focused on the so-called less paper, more aid initiative to improve the effectiveness of humanitarian funding. Uh, Jeremy has also been heavily involved in the harmonized and simplified, re simplified reporting work stream. Uh, and last but not least, very pleased to welcome Sara Sekines, uh, who is Conflict Prevention Partnership Advisor at UNDP here in Geneva. Sara currently focuses on working with partners and on efforts to achieve a sustained reduction in the impact and occurrence of armed violence and conflict with specific specialization on arms control, humanitarian disarmament efforts, and conflict prevention measures. Sara also engages in interagency efforts to align new ways of working across the humanitarian, development, peace, and human rights sectors, and has been actively involved in the discussions specifically related to the humanitarian development nexus work stream uh, as part of the grand bargain process. Um, 
So now I, I'm very pleased to, to introduce uh, once again my co-host, Melissa Patati. Melissa is head of policy at ICFA and has been co-hosting uh, with me uh, the entire series on financing uh, that we've organized over the past months. Uh, Melissa is going to start us off with a presentation introducing the grand bargain and uh, then we'll move on to, as mentioned, the three uh, mentioned work streams. So over to you, Thank Melissa. you, Anharad, and thank you all for joining us. Great turnout here. I just wanted to answer a few quick questions that we've received from several NGOs about the grand bargain and give it with the caveat that these answers are based on ICFA's experience with the grand bargain. ICFA has been present at all of the negotiation rounds of the grand bargain, and we've been very involved in the implementation phase. I saw one of you is participating here from Mercy Malaysia. Mercy Malaysia's Faisal Perdaus was one of ICFA's representatives at the negotiations, and he alternated with our executive director, Nan Bizard, um, and I, I participate in all of those to support them. So first, what is the Graham Bargain? It's a package of 51 commitments organized into 10 different work streams or themes that was negotiated by a group of donors and agencies ultimately with the aim to make humanitarian financing more efficient and more effective so that we could get more resources to affected populations. If you want to look at the origins of the grand bargain, you can trace it all the way back to 2014 when many humanitarian organizations were feeling the pain of funding shortfalls um, and we felt that we had to do something collectively. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General at the time, he appointed a high-level panel on humanitarian financing. This panel launched a report in January of 2016 that was organized into three chapters with ideas on how to address the funding gap. It was uh, first looking at shrinking the needs, second looking at deepening and widening the resource base, and thirdly, finally, becoming more efficient through a grand bargain between donors and agencies um, that could ultimately, in the best case scenario that was put out there, save perhaps a billion dollars that could be used for affected populations. So who was involved in the grand bargain? If you look at this next slide, it shows you the initial grand bargain actors. Um, there are 15 donors, 15 agencies. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side under the agencies that it was uh, not only UN agencies, but also ICRC and IFRC from the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, and also the three NGO consortia involved in the Interagency Standing Committee. So that includes ICFA, Interaction, and SCHR. So these original grand bargain actors were called Sherpas, or negotiators, of the grand bargain. They met four times between February and May 2016, and, in, and at the World Humanitarian Summit, their commitments that they negotiated were launched. Now, these commitments, if you take a look at the next slide, were organized into 10 themes or work streams. So um, the first so the first one you see here is called transparency. It's about getting more visibility on funding flows. A big focus here has been on using something called the IATI data standard to have more visibility. The second one, uh, what used to be called frontline responders, now is national and local responders, is what is more associated with the localization agenda, which you'll hear about from Anne very soon. The third one was a focus on um, using cash, scaling it up as appropriate, and several of the NGO signatories to the grand bargain have made targeted commitments here. The fourth one you see, reduced management costs, has a lot of good components from the NGO perspective, including uh, some commitments related to the UN agencies harmonizing their approaches to NGOs and also perhaps sharing partner capacity assessments. The next one you see here is making a better use of needs assessments. That's a very big topic that's gotten some attention recently at a workshop held in Brussels. Um, the next one, the participation revolution, which is currently co-convened by an NGO consortium called Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response, and the U.S. government is trying to bring affected populations more into the process. Um, the next one, NGOs really care about multi-year funding. Several of us are limited to annual funding or even monthly funding, which is not optimal, especially in protracted situations. 
After that, you see a reduction of earmarking, something very important, especially for UN agencies. And then finally, number nine was on simplified and harmonized reporting, which you'll hear about from Jeremy, and on the humanitarian development nexus, which you'll hear about from Sarah. Now, if you turn to the next slide, who is actually in charge of the grand bargain? There's no one person, one entity in charge. It's really a multilateral effort. Um, so you'll see that each work stream is co-convened by a donor and an agency, and these co-conveners are leading the development of work plans for their respective work streams. You'll see, for example, number nine on reporting, ICFA is co-leading that with Germany. And the implementation phase, the grand bargain is guided by something called a facilitation group. This group is comprised of a representative mix of signatories, including ECHO, IFRC, OCHA, SCHR, Switzerland, UN Women and WFP. This group is meeting regularly to address various issues, and I'll name three that are very important. Number one, uh, the collection and analysis of each of the signatories self-reporting. Number two, commissioning an independent annual report on the grand bargain implementation. And number three, planning the annual meeting of the grand bargain signatories. Uh, this year it will be held on June 20th, right before the ECOSOC Humanitarian Affairs segment. This facilitation group has some support. They will soon be supported by a secretariat staff person who will be hosted by the Interagency Standing Committee Secretariat in Geneva. And hopefully with this new capacity, we'll have an updated web page that will provide more information on the grand bargain. We'll see you can get more information on the grand bargain in this briefing paper, which is hot off the press. It gives you more about the history of the grand bargain, how it was negotiated, and it goes into depth on the commitments and the work streams, but also ways to get involved. I want to close my brief introduction to the grand bargain with one more slide, and this is the key message that ICFA, as an NGO network, was promoting during the negotiations and now in the implementation phase. Ultimately, it's that the humanitarian system must move away from a centralized command and control, one system fits all approach, to one that recognizes we exist as an ecosystem of diverse actors, and we want to see whoever is there on the front lines best place to respond will receive adequate, timely resources that are predictable, sustainable, and ultimately for a contextualized response. NGOs who want to get engaged in grand bargain are welcome to do so. It's not a binding document, but signatories take the grand bargain commitments very seriously, and we all have to report back annually on how we are achieving these commitments. And we want to make sure that the benefits of the grand bargain ultimately reach NGOs. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Melissa. We have uh, one quick follow-up question for you before we move on, um, uh, specifically building on your, your last points. This is a question from Bodo, based in Germany. He asks, are any of the meetings of the work streams you have mentioned open to non-signatories of the Grand Bargain? That is Over a very to you. good question, Bodo. Thank you. Um, you will see that to implement many pieces of a Grand Bargain, we need to have collective action that goes beyond the original signatories, and that includes a lot of different actors. So in our Grand Bargain Explained Guide that we just published today, we go into detail in each of the Grand Bargain work streams, and we highlight areas for NGOs to participate in. And I think, for example, Anne might tell you about one particular um, commitment called the localization marker development, where we have seen a process created that includes non-signatories to get feedback. So there are examples where we reach out to non-signatories to get involved. So thank you for that. OK, great. And thank you. Uh, now we'll move right along uh, to Anne. So Anne Street uh, coming on now, head of humanitarian policy with CAFAD um, and joining us remotely. Anne, uh, I believe we have your audio set up. Good morning. So uh, I, th there were six uh, commitments in the uh, localization um, work stream, which could broadly be said to be grouped under four aspects. So these are investment in, in capacity and partnerships, um, 
funding, measurement, and coordination. So um, uh, what I want to do is just say a little bit about some of the activities that are going on in each of these, uh, these commitments. And um, the IFRC has recently produced a, a very good mapping of, uh, of the activities uh, under all of these work streams, which um, might be of interest to people. So, for example, OCHA has been doing um, some very interesting work now, uh, looking at uh, context-specific coordination, which, um, as people will know, has been on the agenda for quite a long time, but really looking at how how to shift the dial on this and, um, for example, uh, undertaking regular annual reviews of, of coordination in order to make them, them more specific. On capacity strengthening, a huge amount of work, um, understanding what works, um, mapping uh, capacity uh, strengthening initiatives, work by the near network, um, by a group of uh, Asian uh, NGOs, I think some of them are online through the CEFI initiative, the Missed Opportunities Group, um, the the regional coordination of uh, of actors through Rohan. So a huge amount on that. Um, on the funding. Uh, a number of uh, initiatives are being developed with um, the, the NEAR uh, network um, intending to set up a, a new pooled fund and also start network looking at um, the establishment of a, of a start national NGO fund. But I think the thing to really point out on these commitments is that um, this, uh, this includes a, a, a really clear, strong commitment of 25% of humanitarian funding to go to local actors by 2020. Um, there, is, there are some uh, uh, riders in that. Uh, so the actual wording says as directly as possible. Um, so that is uh, now what we're um, moving on to uh, to address. Um, so I want to look at the uh, at what some of the opportunities for um, for for the humanitarian community in this. Um, uh, so, firstly, I think that the, um, the, the funding target, we need to um, look at uh, what do we mean by, by uh, national actors. So, what does it mean as directly as possible? And what is included in the 25%? So, um, We've set up through the IASC Humanitarian Financing Task Team a localization marker working group, which has included UN agencies, donors, and national and international NGOs um, to look at uh, elaborating definitions of national actors. So who is a national actor? who isn't a national actor, and then to look at uh, what is direct funding and what is indirect funding. So what could be included in that 25%? Is it one transaction uh, level? Is it donors direct to national NGOs? Is that how possible is that going to be? So, will it is, it is that through pooled funds? Is that through one transaction level? And we've developed a paper on this, um, uh, and um, it's now going to be uh, disseminated. So, um, we would really urge people to um, participate in a survey that we're now um, developing on it. 
So I'll come back to that at the end. And what I'd like to move on to now is to address some of the um, challenges I think that there are in this um, in this uh, uh, work stream. So if we have a commitment to fund 25% to national actors, um, clearly we have to uh, move the dial from the present 0.2% uh, of direct funding. But depending on how the definitions are agreed in the end, it could actually make reaching the target harder. So if there's a, a narrow definition of what is uh, a, a national actor, if there's a very narrow definition of what is direct funding, and um, the other issue that is, is uh, of contention is um, do we include only financing in that 20%, 25%, or do we include in kind? Do we include uh, material goods? Do we include uh, training, capacity, uh, strengthening, and secondment? So all those things are um, up for de debate, and uh, depending on, on where where the, the definitions are finally agreed, um, it will be easier or harder to, um, to meet that target. But I have to say that uh, the grand bargain, if it was about anything, it was about uh, a commitment by signatories to change the way we work to make uh, uh, the humanitarian system and humanitarian response more efficient and to deliver better to people in need. So uh, I think that it is um, hugely challenging, but we need to challenge ourselves and not to try to uh, put everything that we're doing into very broad definitions and therefore uh, say we're virtually uh, at the 25%. I think there are also some challenges in terms of links to other work streams. So if we are, um, if we are measuring our 25% uh, and how we're doing on that, obviously that requires more transparency and more reporting and um, you know, at a time where we're looking at um, actually streamlining reporting. I think that the other challenge is um, the engagement of Southern actors. I think that um, arguably the strength of the localization commitment of the grand bargain is very much due to the strong voice and advocacy that uh, national actors made in the regional consultations running up to the World Humanitarian Summit. Um, and that was fantastic. And um, we really have to continue to ride on that. Um, perhaps since then, particularly um, on this issue of the the the, uh, the definitions, it's rather sort of gone into the international sphere. So um, I, we do need to keep up the um, uh, the engagement of the entire uh, humanitarian community in this. Um, so m moving on to the next slide. How can NGOs engage? The survey is being launched today, um, and I think uh, this uh, webinar will be sending around the links. It's in French, Arabic, and English. And um, I really would uh, urge everybody to uh, participate in the survey if they can. It's 10 minutes. Give your feedback on what you consider the definitions of national actors are, what about as direct as possible, and what about in kind. 
um, and share it with your partners, share it with your colleagues, um, and uh, disseminate it virtually uh, and um, urge people to participate. It's closing on the 23rd of, of March. Um, so I think that uh, it was mentioned earlier, people asked how, you know, whether um, they could participate in the work streams even if they're not signatories. And uh, I think the answer is yes. There was a, a meeting, for example, that IFRC and the Swiss held last week. They're the, the co-conveners of the localization work stream. And there were um, about 10 or 15 national NGO representatives at that meeting who were not, uh, who weren't themselves signatories. Uh, Voice has also set up a grand bargain task force which meets regularly in Brussels but also people can call in so if your agency is a, a member of Voice do get involved in that and um, they're prioritizing a number of work streams including the localization one. Um, ICFA has been doing work on humanitarian financing over a number of years and has a very vibrant humanitarian financing group which uh, again people can uh, get involved in and participate in remotely, develop policy positions and uh, discuss engagement. Um, I think that there's plenty of room uh, to hold ourselves to account. Um, there are a number of, of INGO signatories as well as uh, the network signing up to the grand bargain. And I think that at the national level, um, humanitarian actors can get together and advocate to signatories, discuss, ask their donors, ask um, UN agencies ask themselves as NGOs, what are, what are you doing to, to uh, fulfill your commitments under the localization work stream and other work streams? So um, I think that uh, that's um, really all I wanted to say. Um, but look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, Melissa here, we have received a lot of questions related to this work stream that we'll talk about later in the webinar, but already we've received a lot of feedback. Um, could you say a little bit more about how um, the definition for localization comes into play? For example, uh, we had one question from Asif in Pakistan, is how can we agree on a standard definition of localization? Um, during the grand bargain negotiations, it was, um, it, it receives a lot of de debate of who should be included when we talk about national and local responders. And you already mentioned in your presentation the challenges uh, for measuring to say who, who, is, who are we talking about, what are we talking about. So could you elaborate a little bit more on um, the definition and the process to achieve it? Thank you. OK. Yes, thanks, Melissa. So um, we set up a, a working group uh, in the summer, in July, after the grand bargain was signed, because one of the, the detailed wording on the localization commitment included um, working with the IASC to develop a localization marker, so to, def so to look at how we track the funding. So this working group soon realized that actually you can't uh, track the funding until you know what you're, what, uh, what the definition of uh, that you're, that you're tracking. So we started discussing um, what does it mean, what does a, what is a national actor? So um, does that include uh, national actors uh, that operate in the country where they're headquartered? Does it include uh, local, local actors operating in a specific geography or a subnational area? Uh, are the Red Cross, Red Crescent national societies included? Do we include national governments, local governments? 
Um, so we've developed a definitions paper after a lot of discussion and a lot of drafting, a lot of redrafting. And basically, uh, where we're at at the moment on that is that um, there we have uh, defined national and local civil society organizations, Red Cross and Red Crescent national societies and national governments. But what we've uh, at, at the moment agreed as not included in those categories of national and local responders are affiliated national and local organizations. So a national branch of an international NGO um, is not included in that. So if an international NGO sets up a branch in Kenya or Bangladesh or Myanmar, that is not a, a, a national actor, that is an affiliated um, actor. Um, southern international uh, uh, NGOs, uh, this is a, an area where there is discussion, but at the moment it's, uh, it's not in, they're not included. Um, international NGOs are uh, also not included as national NGOs and multilateral organizations, so UN agencies and uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the International um, Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. So the, the survey is an attempt really to get uh, to hear the views of uh, both the grand bargain signatories, donors, UN, INGOs, but most particularly to hear from national actors uh, about what their, uh, what their view of what a national actor is. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, very, uh, very grateful for the presentation and also the elaboration on that definitions question and would certainly encourage um, everyone to take a look at the, the definitions paper and also um, to participate in the survey uh, that's being highlighted. So thanks so much. We're going to move now to Jeremy Rempel, consultant with the Less Paper, More Aid initiative uh, with ICFA. Uh, Jeremy, also also joining us remotely. I'll just do a quick check and make sure your audio is sounding fine. Jeremy, are you there? Yes, good morning. I'm here. Good morning. Yes, sound, sounds terrific. Uh, okay, so the floor is yours. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. So, yes, this morning I'd like to share a little bit on some of the background in the reporting work stream and then get into some opportunities for action as well. Um, I should say ICFA has been um, fairly heavily engaged in this area since before the grand bargain or leading up to it through less paper, more aid, as you've heard, uh, donor conditions task force. Uh, also, we're part of the grand bargain as a co-convener in the reporting work stream, so uh, heavily engaged in this area. So for myself, as a, as a starting point to think about the reporting work stream, I think it's helpful to step back and think at a high level about what we're talking about with regard to reporting. So um, in my own mind, I like to think of some different spheres of reporting, uh, whether that's management, so your internal reporting needs that you make decisions on as an organization internally, uh, donor reporting to your funders, uh, specifically with regard to humanitarian work, we have reporting around um, uh, cluster or strategic um, needs through our the humanitarian response plan, et cetera, and public domain reporting, which um, could be seen as transparent reporting as well that gets reported out uh, publicly. Now, ideally, we have a strong degree of alignment between those spheres of reporting so that they uh, have some differences but fit together quite closely uh, uh, as a structure. The Grand Bargain Reporting Workstream is specifically focused on uh, the sphere around donor reporting, uh, but I think you can, you can already see by some of the themes here that there are linkages across other areas as well. 
public domain, for example, in the transparency work stream, uh, certainly some aspects of management reporting linked to reducing management costs, etc. And from the NGO perspective, I think there are some, uh, and some important considerations that we think about when we're looking at the reporting spheres and how they align. So a big one is the degree to which systems are aligned across these spheres or we're creating parallel systems that might be uh, competing with each other for staff time, uh, creating burden, etc. Also, it's important to consider uh, anytime you're doing reporting, how that actually feeds into improving your ability to uh, provide service to affected populations, to provide effective aid, uh, to do your work better. And then I think as we look individually within the spheres too, we have some obvious questions that come up around uh, volume, frequency, complexity, duplication. These are all themes uh, highlighted when we look specifically at how we can improve reporting uh, for example, in the donor sphere. So one of the challenges we have is to take that and turn it into action. Um, one advantage that's, uh, I guess, emerged in the reporting work stream is we actually have had a lot of work done over the past year, year and a half, certainly leading into grand bargain uh, to generate evidence around reporting, um, some of the burden that that creates, had a number of studies done by ISC on donor conditions. Uh, GHD funded something on uh, donor reporting requirements. You've heard already about uh, less paper, more aid. Um, all of these helped feed into some of the commitments uh, that were made as part of the grand bargain. Following that, we also had some additional work done by the Global Public Policy Institute, uh, funded by Germany on how to better harmonize donor reporting and making recommendations around that. Um, and some unique things ac across all of this evidence, there's actually been a quite high degree of um, consistency with regard to some of the conclusions around how it might be possible to save significant work time, the existence of uh, burden by having multiple templates and multiple reporting streams to donors that could be uh, better streamlined. So the evidence has been quite clear that there are significant um, gains to be made by looking into how we can uh, better handle reporting in a way that's more harmonized, that's simplified, um, reduces the burden on staff in the field, and can still meet the needs of donors and hopefully improve our ability to deliver effective aid. Uh, so all of this evidence, uh, there's this question of what we do with it. I think frequently what happens is evidence and good studies get compiled together into lessons learned. We think about it and then it may or may not get translated into action. So one of our, uh, one of our key points following especially the, the grand bargain is how we translate all of this evidence into action. Um, so I have some very clear ways in which we're trying to do that. And the grand bargain has certainly been um, a helpful way to uh, frame our further action. I put up here on the screen just specifically what the commitments were. Um, so there are three areas of commitment around reporting in the grand bargain. Um, to simplify and harmonize reporting requirements, uh, investing in technology, and enhancing quality. And uh, I added some of the bold here. I think to me one thing that's important to keep in mind as we look through the commitments made in the grand bargain is what our objective actually is. So the, the higher level objective is that we're producing substantive qualitative reporting, um, becoming more efficient in use of resources. So it's really around uh, how we're doing reporting in a way that's uh, uh, promoting good quality reporting, effective and efficient use of resources, and enabling us to better meet affected populations needs. Um, it's easy sometimes to confuse our objectives and see um, a template, for example, as our higher level objective, uh, when those are actually more tools that we would use to achieve the higher level objectives. Just in, in the way we think about how to uh, harmonize reporting, how to, um, yeah, how to move forward, it's important, I think, uh, to keep some of those things clear in our minds. So uh, to help frame our uh, action as well, the, the study done by GPPI uh, 
following the grand bargain has been quite helpful in generating some very clear recommendations to move forward. I should note that uh, this study is available publicly on the GPPI website, so you can uh, read the whole thing there. It's quite well done, drawing on um, some of the base work done through Less Paper, More Aid and other um, research to uh, really develop some clear conclusions around how we could pilot a harmonized donor reporting framework. So one of the key things in the GPPI study um, is around what's called a 10 plus 3 approach. And a lot of research was done by GPPI to look across donors to try and understand what would it look like to harmonize reporting requirements, uh, what common factors already exist in reporting requirements, and uh, how can we turn this into a practical framework. So the approach that they came up with was uh, to identify, they identified 10 key dimensions that are really uh, quite common across all donors such that you could cover uh, 80, 90 percent of donor reporting requirements by having some clear guidance in these areas. So you see, uh, you see those uh, 10 areas highlighted on the left. Um, in addition to that, they came up with uh, sort of a menu list of options to choose an additional three. And the idea is by having a a harmonized 10 plus, uh, plus a, a bonus additional three that one could choose from from a menu, you could really get up to cover essentially 100% of donor reporting requirements. Uh, so it would be some degree of flexibility between uh, how you report to individual donors on the, the menu option there, but um, essentially there's a solid group of 10 dimensions that would cover the vast majority of all donor reporting needs. Um, so part of what we're doing now is trying to take this um, uh, take this recommended recommended approach and turn it into a, an actual pilot project to test out a little more clearly uh, what this looks like in action. Obviously, it's nice to have good study done, but we, we need to see more practically as well um, how this can function in the field. So that's a key step we're moving to now. Um, so we have pilot planning actually underway uh, starting from, well, really starting from November of last year, we had a, a follow-up meeting to the GPPI report to hear those results. Uh, beginning in January now to present, we've engaged heavily between ICFA, uh, Germany, and GPPI to start the planning for a pilot and generate interest, put together partners. Uh, the idea is we'd, we'd kick off March 24th. Um, with a, with a final meeting of people engaged in the pilot. And this would be based on this 10 plus 3 approach, uh, as I shared in the last slide. Um, and what this, what this starts to look like from the, from the planning so far, you see here, is a, a two-year period where we look uh, really specifically at harmonized reporting. Um, we'd like to target three locations. We're in the process of selecting specific countries between uh, donors and uh, NGOs and UN partners that we can agree on. Um, currently, we have about six donors, about six large NGOs, and uh, I think about four UN agencies that are committed to engaging in the pilot. Um, and you see the way I, I've set up here, there's a, a couple of elements in the pilot to look at here. So we, we want to go with with a fairly rigorous core pilot where we uh, have a number of set locations that we track very carefully through a standard process of feedback, lessons learned, uh, conclusions, etc. cetera. Uh, the concept of this could also be somewhat of an open design so that uh, as we move forward in this two-year period and start to generate lessons learned, that even outside the core area, people could start to apply those and do some experimentation as well. And Certainly, this might uh, relate as well to uh, national, local NGOs and some of the effects uh, that uh, piloting this uh, reporting framework might have there. That's one thing we want to track specifically uh, through the pilot is the effect at that level. Um, so this is sort of the, the basic design we're working with now. Another action point, uh, pilot-wise, so we're, we're still looking for a lot of feedback as to what the pilot looks like, um, how people can engage, um, soliciting uh, 
partners, NGO partners to engage. So there's a few ways in which um, people can do that. So when some homework, uh, the GPPI study that I mentioned earlier that's available on the website uh, has the 10 plus 3 an approach, approach in it. We're really looking for some practical feedback around what people think about that approach. I think it would be great to have uh, NGOs, even if you're not directly engaged in the pilot, to send some feedback about what you think uh, regarding the 10 plus 3 approach. That would be very helpful feedback to get in the coming, uh, in the coming few weeks. So if you're able to do that, that would be quite helpful. Um, we are looking for um, organizations to continue to volunteer to engage, whether that's in the core pilot participation um, or in some of extended participation as we see how lessons learned can be um, scaled up. I think that would be great if people have an interest there. Uh, it's excellent if you're able to contact me. Um, and then the, uh, another key thing we're working on through uh, the pilot and actually the broader uh, work on reporting is connecting the dots between some of the other work streams. So whether that's uh, UN harmonization efforts, uh, the other work streams in the grand bargain to be conscious of how things fit together well um, so that we're all pulling in the same direction and not working too much in silos. And just a final note there, I think although we're talking about donor reporting, it really is critical to get NGO participation and feedback. We want this um, really to be a way in which NGOs can provide good feedback into donor reporting, but I think also uh, think through how some of the reporting spheres I talked about early on can fit better together, whether that's management reporting, aligning with donor reporting, transparency questions, et cetera. So NGO feedback is a critical piece of that. There are a few challenges. Um, it's not entirely an easy task to harmonize reporting across multiple actors. Like one key thing that we're looking at through the pilot uh, is the effect on informal reporting and uh, better understanding how that is a burden on staff. So we, we frequently have formal reporting requirements through midterm uh, end of project reporting that are quite clear. However, there's also a whole range of other requests that frequently come through, whether it's email, requests based on quality issues, uh, just need for additional information. These typically happen in a much higher degree of uh, frequency than formal reporting. So this is one of the questions we have in a harmonized reporting framework is uh, how harmonizing a formal reporting framework might affect informal flows of information. Uh, just another challenge, I think, you know, there's a lot going on right now. We've got 10 work streams just in the grand bargain. Um, I think Ann, Ann uh, brought this up a little bit earlier too. We just need to be careful that we don't have too, so much going on that people are working in silos, unaware of how things link together. Um, and we want to be careful just that there's not a, a degree of fatigue. So we have to just be conscious of how things are fitting together in the different reporting work streams, ensuring that we're pulling in the same direction, um, and help people not get tired with, uh, with dealing with these, these work streams as much as possible. I think there really is some good work to be done, and we don't want uh, the technical pieces of that challenge to to kill the interest in moving forward. Uh, and finally, I just, this is me with some, some kids in Mongolia years ago. I worked for a long time in audits, different types of reporting. So I've been aware through my career of just the balance that's required to make sure that we're not coming up with uh, systems and tools that are so heavy that we we forget the purpose of why we're there in the first place. So there really is a need to uh, be careful about the balance, come up with systems and tools, whether that's for reporting or other things that are effective and useful, but ultimately help us serve the people that we're there to serve. Uh, so I think it's always good to keep that in mind as we're working to move forward with these work streams. Great, that's it for now. I'll, I'll conclude there and um, happy to take questions at the end of the presentations today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, just a quick follow-up before we move on to our next speaker. Um, you mentioned the linkages that the reporting work stream has with other work streams. And of course, uh, a work stream that is uh, receiving a lot of questions today is the localization related work stream. And there's a commitment there that talks about reducing barriers 
um, administrative barriers that would normally block national and local responders from accessing funding, which is quite linked to the work stream that you're engaged with. We have a question from one, an ICFA member, Amel, from Virginie, um, which works in Lebanon, so great to hear from Virginie. She's asking if you could elaborate a little bit more on the pilot to test out the new 10 plus 3 reporting approach. Um, do you, could you say a little bit more about which countries would be selected? Um, there have been some NGOs who've already come forward and volunteered to participate. She's wondering about national NGO participation in the reporting pilot. Uh, I know it's a little bit earlier to say anything definitive, but do you want to address those questions? Over to you, Jeremy. Sure. I think. Um... Right. So briefly, one of, one of the challenges in designing a pilot is location. Um, it's, it's easy to agree on general regions. So for certain, we have um, interest in a Middle East location, in probably an East Africa location, and an Asia location as well. When it comes down to specific country, um, we start to get a challenge in that we have to try and put together a core group of donors and NGOs and local partners such that we have a, a big enough pool of participation to make the pilot meaningful. So it becomes a little challenged in terms of the order in which we select location, get partners in. Um, so like I said, we have um, about six donors, European government donors, um, some North American donors engaged, and six larger NGOs about right now we started with. Um, the advantage there is we have a, a broad range of locations that we can pick. So over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna try and narrow down some specific locations in those three regions. And at that point, we'll be able to start engaging more with some of our local partners um, to uh, see how we can engage better in the specific three countries that we'd like to start piloting in with our partners there. So um, it's, it's hard to say exactly what countries those will be yet. We still have to have some discussion there, but uh, certainly uh, Middle East, East Africa, and Asia are the regions that we're going to be looking in to partner with. So, so in the coming weeks, certainly by the end of March, as we come to a better agreement on location, we'll be able to start reaching out more specifically with some of our local partners. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Jeremy. And I guess it must be quite early for you, so appreciate your, your joining us uh, at this hour. Um, we're yes, going no to problem. move next to Sara, uh, who will be uh, walking us through some thoughts on the humanitarian development nexus. Sara, over to you. You have the floor. So uh, as they presented, I'm Sara Seconds from UNDP, and I also co-chair a task team in the Interagency Standing Committee on the Humanitarian and Development Nexus with specific focus on protracted crisis with my fellow co-chair, um, Rudy Konings from WHO. So the grand bargain, uh, as uh, Melissa already said, the grand bargain is about the need to work together efficiently, transparently, and harmoniously with new and existing partners. And that this indeed will require us to innovate, collaborate, and adapt mindsets. And the whole purpose is, of course, to better serve people in need. So the key elements that I will be discussing under Workstream 10 on the humanitarian development nexus has to do with the overall focus on reducing the needs of affected populations, uh, the current work plan and recent activities, links with other work streams, and an update on the new way of working and link with the peace nexus. So enhancing engagement between humanitarian and development actors to not only meet needs but reduce needs focuses on uh, a number of elements. One is decreasing humanitarian need by focusing existing resources and capacities towards prevention, mitigation and preparedness. Investing in durable solutions for refugees and, and uh, forcibly displaced persons. Investing in social protection programs with focus on national and local systems. Performing joint multi-hazard risk and vulnerability analysis, and I'll get back to that one. And invest in new partnerships with comparative advantages and value added. And NGOs, of course, particularly at local level, have a crucial role to play in all of the, these above, 
and they need to help us ensure that investment in prevention, mitigation and preparedness happens at the local level and with local and national actors to create a shared vision. NGOs will be crucial in ensuring that these investments focus on local and national level, working closely with governments and with the support of international organizations. Joint risk and vulnerability analysis and planning must be done with and in support of local actors, both to feed into the analysis process and to form a shared vision of priorities for addressing vulnerabilities. And again, NGOs will have a crucial part to play in ensuring it is with the affected populations that conditions the analysis and the formulation of priorities. So if we look a little bit on the recent activities under Workstream 10, uh, the core part of this work stream going forward is the rollout of what has been labeled the new way of working, both at country level and at policy levels. Against the backdrop of the sustainable development goals, ending needs by reducing risks and vulnerabilities is now a shared responsibility among all actors and stakeholders within the United Nations system, but also beyond thinking of the signatories of the grand bargain, if you wish. And based on this shared responsibility, humanitarian and development actors must now jointly define for themselves and for their context collective outcomes that transcend long-standing conventional thinking, other attitudinal, institutional and funding obstacles. The new way of working is about ensuring that all parts of the UN system, based on their comparative advantage, work together towards jointly defined collective outcomes and set out clear roles and responsibilities around delivering against those outcomes. And in short, you could say that the new way of working is about obtaining greater interoperability between humanitarian, development and peace activities, plans and programs. And this in particular calls for a much, much more coherent approach in assessments, planning and programming towards reinforcement of the local capacities. It does not mean that humanitarians uh, will move towards development activities and vice versa. The different principles uh, are kept, but we have shared goals. And humanitarian principles will always guide humanitarian actions and should not be undermined. But while principles may differ, the centrality of human rights provides all the foundations required to work towards shared development goals with peace dividends. Some of the milestones looking ahead uh, under this work stream includes uh, upcoming meeting in Copenhagen, which I think also focuses a little bit on what Jeremy mentioned in terms of turning the evidence now we, that we know into action. The government of Denmark in collaboration with uh, uh, OCHA and UNDP and the World Bank will host a high level workshop in uh, 10 days or so. Uh, and the objectives are in brief, to look at country cases, assess progress and identify opportunities and propose ways to overcome barriers to implement this new way of working. Secondly, that, that they will demonstrate high level multi-stakeholder support to advance and accelerate implementation through action points to overcome blockages, noting key milestones and opportunities that leverage measures, measures being taken by different actors. Uh, this will also be followed. It is uh, thought of uh, an event in Washington uh, in April, which also will be at high level and focus on uh, taking by donor countries and, and states to take leadership and move this agenda forward. A third element is the um, Interagency Standing Committee UN Working Group Transition Joint Action Plan, which also includes country missions. And here I want to specifically mention uh, what has been called unprecedented, which is strange in itself, uh, a workshop that was held uh, late last year in which the Interagency Standing Committee met with the UN Development Group Working Group on Transition to elaborate further on what it entails to do joint planning, joint analysis and joint programming. And this is very much uh, a breakthrough in terms of having policy discussions and drilling down to find some of the uh, or identify the challenges that needs to be overcome to actually make this a reality. And this work continues with a number of, of uh, 
uh, actions and, and activities in this joint action plan that was developed during the retreat in October. Uh, and the fourth initiative uh, which is being taken forward is a people pipeline. And that one focuses in particular on the recognition that whilst many of the organization uh, or the entities in the UN uh, possess an unparalleled reservoir of specialized expertise in, in many of its ent entities, there's a clear gap when it comes to experts within these UN entities who possess system-wide planning expertise who could leverage this expertise to contribute to a more coherent and coordinated UN approach in the given context. So also internally, the UN is working quite a lot to speed up uh, our ability to work across the pillars of humanitarian work, development, and uh, peace and security. Some of the links to other work streams. Uh, all of the work streams under the Grand Bargain were originally meant to complement each other. And uh, we have looked in the work stream 10 uh, specifically on how we partner with or link up to the work stream 2 on localization. As you've seen, there's a lot of elements in here that are relevant to, to the success of the humanitarian development nexus to uh, achieve uh, true localization. And the work stream 7 on multi-year planning and financing. On Workstream 2, on localization and support of, uh, of support and funding tools, uh, we need to recognize that NGOs are often the first to respond to crisis, remaining in the communities they serve before, during, and after emergencies. So they're a critical interface to uh, decreasing uh, the needs in the long run. And we're working to define localization markers, which was also mentioned uh, previously by previous speakers to identify barriers to direct funding and increase opportunities for and effectiveness of funding as direct as possible. And in linking with Workstream 7 uh, on collaborative humanitarian multi-year planning and financing, uh, early results of review show that multi-year financing promotes positive change in agency behavior with tendency to do more on design, research, adaptive programming, iterative improvement, all of which likely enhance overall program quality. But I should also caution and say that early results show no clear evidence of direct positive impact of multi-year planning and financing on resilience and on reducing the needs of affected populations, at least partly because funding does not seem to be at scale. There's simply just not enough. There's also continued needs for multi-year planning and financing to go beyond 18 months and for more tools and guidance and case studies on this. And as was mentioned by previous speakers, uh, the short-sightedness of, of annual or even monthly funding is simply a huge obstacle to um, improving the work in the humanitarian development nexus. So uh, a short update on the new way of working, as it's called. Progress has already begun in transcending this humanitarian development peace divide through humanitarian plans that are being done in close consultation with development and peace building actors and are designed to achieve common objectives. A couple of examples that may have uh, may be known to many of you are the Lebanon and Jordan response plans for the Syria crisis, the regional refugee and resilience plan called 3RP in response to the Syria crisis, the Somalia compact and the Sahel regional response plan, which has been developed not not only across the UN system, but also with uh, partners beyond. On the financing side, progress includes a global concessional financing facility launched in 2016 by the World Bank, UN and the Islamic Development Bank. The G7 pledge to provide risk insurance to 400 million more people by 2020. The UN World Bank partnership is moving forward on providing catalytic funding to seven to nine countries to enhance activities on the humanitarian development peace nexus. The Global Preparedness Partnership was launched in 2016 to provide a platform for providing expertise and financing towards preparedness and prevention related to natural hazards in particular. But of course, we also need to keep <coughs> excuse me, in mind the link with the peace side of the nexus with, for example, the, the uh, example on the screen in front of you in DRC. And this 
it remains a, a sensitive topic in terms of, of uh, providing the humanitarian space on neutrality and impartiality and ensuring that um, humanitarian needs are met regardless of, of uh, the connections to development uh, work and in, in the attempts to try to decrease the need over the long run. So what does this mean for NGOs? Uh, as you've heard, I've mentioned the critical role of NGOs as frontline responders or the, or the, 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 the primary actors on the ground and that with, without the insights of NGOs, there is very little that, that can be done in improving the way we work in the nexus, as it's called, the shared ecosystem that we all uh, work in, whether humanitarian worker or development worker or peace worker. Uh, we have the same target groups, we have the same beneficiaries, but we have different timelines and, and different objectives. But we have to start looking at the ultimate backdrop of the sustaining development goals in terms of ensuring that we also decrease the need for humanitarian action and can let beneficiaries move on uh, into uh, the development potentials. Uh, we, you have an absolute critical role in ensuring that analysis, planning and implementation is driven by the needs of these affected people and objectives of reducing needs rather than by top-down institutional agendas and structures. You are the frontline responders and in, in humanitarian action and as such the most important element in making the response in the nexus efficient and effective going ahead. Sarah, I should perhaps also, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is very helpful that you ended with the slide on implication for NGOs. Uh, we, while you were speaking, we had a poll um, to ask participants how familiar they were with the new way of working. And the vast majority are unfamiliar with the new way of working. And we've received questions about how NGOs can get engaged. So could you say a little bit more about the new way of working? Uh, where can people go to find more about it? Um, is it publicly available? And uh, does it involve NGOs at all? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. And yes, yeah, the short answer is yes. If it does not involve you, then it will not become a new way of working. But it is. Uh, it has become a slogan, if you wish. And much of these policy discussions are um, done in uh, policy forums um, in which the UN is dominant. Uh, there's no doubt about that, but I absolutely welcome you to work through the consortia mentioned in the Interagency Standing Committee, the Interaction, ICWA, uh, others that have a voice in these um, uh, foras in which we do want more engagement from NGOs. We want to have your first, <laughs> first line inside on how many of the challenges in the new way of working can be overcome. When it comes to information on this, um, I will provide some of the, the, the material we have to the organizers of this webinar that can be distributed. And uh, there will also be uh, upcoming uh, notes, policy notes, coming out from the task team on the humanitarian development nexus in the near future. Um, but shortly, if I can just mention some of these challenges, if there's time, that might be of interest because some of these will concern NGOs. Agreeing on the problem and recognizing the need to change is not going to be enough, even with a shared vision and commitment. And uh, we know that both the UN system, state ministries, and other la larger multilateral organizations, administrations, and even dual mandated non-governmental organizations are not designed to work easily across these pillars. Uh, as been mentioned, the financing uh, side has many uh, drawbacks in terms of working across a more uh, a larger interoperability between these pillars. And we also have ownership issues in terms of looking at how many of the plans on the ground are being developed. Many of you will be familiar with the UNDAF, which is a, a negotiated document between uh, the governments and the UN system on development where you have a strong component of the government's priorities and, and, and uh, in, in, um, negotiated into this document. And then you have the human, humanitarian response plans, which are primarily UN and NGOs that 
sit around the table to the extent that that happens and, and elaborates on the plans for humanitarian action. And in order to work across these pillars, you will have to enter the discussion on, on uh, discussion with governments on humanitarian uh, work and hum reaching humanitarian uh, needs or answering to humanitarian needs. And of course, in any situation that is conflict related, this does raise questions in terms of uh, to what extent humanitarians would want to engage with government uh, actors on that. And one of the principles, of course, is to ascertain to what extent authorities are willing and uh, responsible to uphold international standards and norms, which is a very sensitive uh, discussion to hold and to have in the first place. So there's, there's a lot of challenges uh, coming on this as we go ahead. And to address these challenges, we will absolutely need an open and very frank discussion with all frontline responders and that primarily is NGOs. Thank you, over to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Sara. Very much appreciated um, by everyone. As we can see, a lot of uh, great um, additional questions coming in here on the back end. Um, we have received a lot of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them today, but we'll we'll have time to address a few more. Um, but as we have done in previous events, uh, we will do our absolute best to get uh, actually written answers to the questions that are coming in, so that in the follow-up communications uh, to all of you who are participating today, uh, you can get the full set of, uh, of questions and, and responses uh, from our panelists. Um, but for the time we have remaining, I'll give the floor over to Melissa to uh, lead us through some uh, questions for our panel. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks, Anne Harad. Uh, the first batch of questions I would like to pose to Anne, uh, because they're related to localization. Uh, Anne, I have three questions for you. Number one, Isabel in France and Roberta in France were asking about the issue of capacity investment. It's one of the commitments of the ground bargain, but there is limited funding available for that, and we see donors struggling to try to balance funding that they're giving for emergency response and longer-term investment. Um, could you say anything about any initiatives out there specifically for capacity strengthening? The second question I have is from Leia in Spain, and I couldn't think of a better person to ask this question. She asks, what is the complementary role of international NGOs in the localization discussion in the context of the grand bargain? And we got a question from Man who asks a similar thing, how can international NGOs remain relevant in the localization discussion? And the final uh, question comes from Fiona in Afghanistan, um, who noticed that um, several donors are reluctant to fund more local partners. Um, they prefer to fund larger projects with less partners. Um, it's tied to issues like risk and uh, capacity to manage grants. Um, Sebastian mentioned that we've already had an example of this recently in Lebanon with regard to cash. So could you say a little bit more about how you see the grand bargain work stream support for local and national responders uh, running into that trend? Um, so that's a lot to ask you, Anne. Um, I'm handing over to you and see what you think. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Yeah, so great questions on uh, capacity building, on the role of INGOs, and on the, the tensions um, between larger grants uh, to less actors. And I think, you know, all of these things are um, real challenges in the localization agenda. Um, investments in capacity building. I think there's some, uh, you know, some good work being done by individual donors trying to look at this. So um, one of the uh, one of the donors that I think is really leading the way on the localization agenda is is Australia and trying to do some really creative work. So they, the 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 uh, Good Humanitarian Donor Group, which is 36. Um, donors signed up to the Good Humanitarian Principles now have a work stream on localization, which um, the Australians and I believe the Canadians are, 
are heading up. Um, and Australia is looking at some uh, strong capacity investments, uh, for example, with um, the, uh, their Australian Red Cross and with their um, INGO preferred partners, and um, really uh, requiring them to work with and strengthen the capacity of their their national partners um, and providing you know greater amounts of money to for preparedness um, into local governments to strengthen their their capacity initiatives. Another thing that um, uh, Australia has been doing is um, uh, working on direct secondments with. Uh, with organisations, there is actually a huge amount. I think the um, you know the capacity strengthening initiatives is perhaps one of the sort of areas of great in, greatest investment. Uh, another one is the um, the uh, humanitarian leadership academy, and there's quite a lot of work going on also in um, you know at a, at a southern NGO uh, level. So there's details of some of that um, in a in a in a document that IFRC have uh, have commissioned, and perhaps we could look at sharing that that online. Um, in on the issue of what's the complementary role of of INGOs in the localization agenda? Yeah, so I think there are you know there are several areas that um, you know INGOs are, are particularly well placed on obviously you know the a lot of these discussions go on at the global level so INGOs you know are much more present than um, you know in in New York and Geneva so I think that they you know they can sort of take forward those um, those uh, policy and advocacy positions, but also I think it's really important that they work with their southern partners to enable them to be to be part of those um, those initiatives and those policy discussions. Um, and one of the uh, you know the the sort of complementary roles, for example, that. Uh, CAFOD and 29 other NGOs are, are um, involved in, in, in um, on the sort of localization stream is this uh, charter for change around changing the way that INGOs work with their national partners. Um, the, the, the question on the larger grants to less actors I think, yeah, I think that is a a, a, a big tension that um, Sebastian rightly identifies, and um, you know we all we know that uh, donors have you know are under the same efficiency pressures to have less um, less le less administrative. Uh, capacity and so they they need to uh, push out more money to large actors and I think this is um, a challenge but I think one of the ways that this can be addressed is uh, through those agreements actually ensuring that their large grantees uh, do uh, comply with the, um, you know, with the localization commitments on uh, of of the grand bargain on um, on uh, providing money for um, uh, uh, capacity strengthening and for multi-year funding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So donors can, you know, can encourage those grantees even if they can't fund directly um, to uh, a whole myriad of small small grants. 
Thank you so much, Anne. I want to quickly answer three questions on process and then turn it back to each of the speakers for the final question. Um, on the process of the grand bargain, we heard from Paul in the Netherlands. What are the mechanisms to hold governments accountable for implementing their commitments? Um, what we've seen in the grand bargain process is that each signatory, including donors, uh, but also agencies, are expected to submit what they call a self-report, where each signatory says what they are doing to implement the grand bargain. In addition, the facilitation group is using uh, some independent sources to come up with a report on the grand bargain implementation at a collective level, and that information will become available for a signatories meeting in June 20th. So there is that reporting mechanism. In addition, if you look at specific elements of work streams, for example, cash, there are outside groups who are keeping a very close eye on how the grand bargain is being implemented. The second question on the process comes from Evert. He said, how are people in the field aware of the grand bargain? How can they get involved? I, I have to admit that uh, many people People, when we go to the field and we talk to them, they haven't really heard much about the grand bargain, or if they have, they haven't heard the details. That's why we're trying to do things like this webinar. Um, we have the briefing paper there, and once the uh, secretariat has a staff person dedicated to supporting, I think you're going to see more communication products coming out. So hopefully there will be some more awareness coming out about the grand bargain. And the last question comes from Olivier in Switzerland, who um, asks more about the role of the NGO consortia who are taking part in the grand bargain negotiations and are now involved in the implementation. Um, we work well, very well with Interaction SCHR in the grand bargain. I can say for ICFA, we've met with our members before and after the meetings. We've been trying to, through our finance working group, for example, and our donor conditions group, involve NGOs in the implementation. Um, and we're very happy to see several individual NGOs have signed on to the grand bargain and have come up with their own very specific, even targeted um, commitments. And they'll, they're also submitting self-reports there. So we're working in through different ways to promote NGO involvement in the grand bargain. So the last question I wanted to ask, um, and it's going to go to each of our speakers, it's coming from Anne in Switzerland. Um, who says, you know, we've been tackling a lot of these issues that are discussed in the grand bargain for decades, and we haven't yet been able to um, achieve what we want. What gives us hope? What gives us optimism that we will be able to achieve um, these commitments now? Um, so let's go first to Sarah with this question about your optimism, then Jeremy, and then Anne. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Melissa, and, and that's a very good question. Indeed, much of what we have been discussing here today is not new, uh, even though we call it a new way of working. Uh, I think a couple of things are different today, um, or several things are different today. Uh, we have an urgent urgency that uh, is unprecedented. We have um, most of crises turning protracted. We have many protracted crises compounding on top of each other and the capacity of the humanitarian system to cope with the humanitarian crisis is running out. Uh, so that's an urgency in terms of, of looking at how to address this. Of course, to address these uh, protracted crises has a political dimension that is beyond the humanitarian response and, and therefore it's very good, uh, I think, some of the, the uh, priority areas outlined by the new Secretary General in terms of looking at prevention as the top priority going forward. Uh, the new Secretary General has also called for a reform of the UN development system as well as a reform of the peace and security agenda following the, the uh, review of the peace architecture as they call it. Uh, member states have a very, very important role to play and they have uh, adopted uh, to twin resolutions on sustaining peace, which to a certain extent at least raised to uh, discussion amongst member states how to address the political dimension of a protracted uh, crisis and to make prevention the priority going forward. But that's just one side of the story. The other is how can we make sure that the incentives are there for the changes to happen? And since we've been discussing this for a long, long time, the problems have been there for uh, a long time. Uh, what are the incentives that needs to be put in place? 
And one of the elements that I think the grand bargain has tried to tackle is the, cutting the silos in the financing system to try to make it possible in the first place to engage over uh, the various pillars that, that uh, work in the ecosystems that we share. Uh, I think another reality is that in the past, partially because there were fewer protracted crises, but partially also because the financial situation was better, there was more funds in, in place uh, or available. So um, there wasn't the incentive to look at how we can do more for the buck. Uh, now that is becoming a reality, partially because uh, of the compounded uh, and, and nature of protracted crises, but partially also because the, the financing situation of the world has shrunk uh, somewhat. So those, those are a couple of the, the things that comes first to mind in terms of what is different now and why are we more optimistic to try to resolve this issue uh, at this time. The World Humanitarian Summit, of course, raised all this to attention and we've all signed off. So it's no longer voluntary. It's actually the objective that we all have to follow. Thank you, Sarah. Over to you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Melissa. So I think um, with regard to the reporting work stream, in addition to some of the um, some of the basic things that Sarah mentioned that I think can apply fairly broadly, um, I think I think the solid evidence base that I mentioned uh, as part of the uh, work leading into the grand bargain and follow up as well has really provided a sound a sound body of evidence that. Um, People can, can have been able to look through and get some some practical idea of what can actually be achieved if we harmonize uh, reporting. And I think uh, as as part of the response to that, a, sign, a significant and growing number of donors have really come forward and expressed a strong interest in um, in being willing to consider a harmonized reporting template. Um, so not just a push from NGOs, but also um, a, even a pull from donors to, to try and pull it forward. So there's been a really strong critical mass of uh, uh, particularly donors and uh, other agencies really wanting to try this now. So it's yeah, not, not a new concept, but I think we're at a point where uh, we've built towards a critical mass of partners that are actually willing to take forward some uh, some very practical action and come to agreement on how to pilot things. So. So it's a good opportunity to take advantage of at this point in time. Thank you, Jeremy. Over to you, Anne. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I think uh, we do have reason to be optimistic. And I think perhaps the first um, thing to point to in the context of the grand bargain and the, the work stream on more support and funding tools to local and national responders is the wording of the commitments and they are really strong i mean the target of 25 percent by 2020 is fantastic i mean if if anybody had said uh we would have that target two or three years ago i wouldn't have believed it um and it's the only real target in terms of numbers in the uh in the uh, in the um, the grand bargain commitment, so I think it does give us something to work towards. I think also the fact that you know national actors have been uh, so vocal in calling for this um, has really and and that that uh, you guys will continue to ensure that this happens is um, another reason to be really optimistic. And I think that, you know, donors and the humanitarian community in general has recognized really that we do have to change and we do have to, uh, you know, work in more efficient, more enabling um, ways uh, that deliver better outcomes. I think also that um, you know there is more transparency in the system now, and we have better tools for that um, to measure and to know what's going on. So I think that you know we can 
hold ourselves uh, and uh, others to account. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of uh, room for optimism, but I think it it um, it really requires the concerted effort of all of us in being willing to change and in uh, holding ourselves and our fellow signatories uh, to account to live up to the commitments we've made. Thank you, Anne. And just uh, from my perspective at, at ICFA, I wanted to say that you know, at ICFA, members have been struggling with uh, getting predictable, sustainable, adequate funding for years. We've been very involved in the Interagency Standing Committee Finance Task Team, working at the working level on many of the issues raised in the grand bargain. Um, and we were struggling to get some momentum until the high-level panel, to their credit, really elevated um, the, the visibility and the political momentum behind it. So we do see this is the first process that brings together the donor side, the agency side, um, to come together around some of these issues. We do need to keep an eye uh, on the trends. For example, what we're seeing in Lebanon with cash, uh, what will happen with needs assessments. Um, are we seeing importing increased reporting requirements? We will need to keep an eye on that, but we do have a huge opportunity here. And I'll just close on my part by giving a big thanks to you all as speakers. Uh, we thank all of ICFA's members who have been participating in all of these webinars and who've also been very active in all of the aspects of the grand bargain. Uh, for example, we didn't get a chance to really dig deep today on things like cost structures, uh, something that NRC has been very involved in, um, but we do have lots of examples that we'll try to explain through our briefing paper and other opportunities um, to get you more connected there. I did want to thank PHAP for helping us on this webinar and a big thanks to James Shell for his support in preparing these with PHAP. Over to you, Anne Harad. Great. Thank you, Melissa, and um, thank you so much. It's been a, a great uh, series and such a pleasure to co-host with you, and thanks for your uh, very able moderation of the Q&As, uh, in particular, very much appreciated by all. Uh, also from our side at PHAP, a warm thank you to all of the speakers in today's session, uh, as well as all of uh, you as very active participants. Uh, great to see all of your input, and once again, uh, just want to highlight that uh, we will be uh, working together together with the team at ICFA to ensure that as many of the questions that came in um, are responded in writing uh, in the follow-up, so you'll have that as an ongoing resource. Um, also to just let you know that the recordings and all of the mentioned resources during today's event will be available in the coming days on the event webpage, and once translated there will also be subtitles, as Marcus mentioned in the chat, in both French and Arabic, uh, so do keep an eye out for those, they should be available within the next two to three weeks. Uh, there will also be from ICVA a whiteboard video on the topic, and that will be coming out and again mentioned in follow-up email communication. And now as we're coming to the end of this series on humanitarian financing, I'd like to provide a quick uh, reminder about the resources available from previous sessions. Uh, you can see the banners uh, there on the, on the PowerPoint slide. You can access all of the recordings, again, with the translations into French and Arabic, as well as the related resources on the relevant event pages. And you can get right to them now, if you wish, by clicking on those banners. Those are active links. Um, yeah, I would like to, to really uh, emphasize as well the availability of the recording from the last session we did. Uh, this was on private funding available to NGOs and the other uh, resources, including um, there was quite a long list of follow-up questions that our guest experts on private funding um, kindly provided answers to in writing. So you can uh, follow um, the links there to get all of those resources. Then last but not least, uh, and looking forward, now I'm very happy to announce that PHAP will continue this fruitful collaboration uh, with ICFA. Uh, the two organizations will be working together to produce for you a new learning stream. This will be focusing on the topic of humanitarian coordination and the role of NGOs. So look forward to that, uh, which will be starting uh, in the coming months. That'll be through both the spring and fall of this year. Uh, 
Um, so very much uh, looking forward to a new series of interactive sessions uh, aimed to professionals who are working in both international and national NGOs uh, to develop a, a better understanding of the various humanitarian coordination mechanisms that are out there and how uh, NGOs can engage in them at different levels. Uh, so with that, thanks once again to all of our uh, participants for active participation, for the, to the teams uh, here at PHAP and at ICVA uh, for all of their work in preparing today's event, and of course to our speakers uh, for their valuable input on the different grand bargain work, stream, work streams. Uh, please do take a moment now to fill in the survey uh, to give us some feedback following the event. And with that, this is Anherit Lang and the teams from PHAP and ICFA signing off from Geneva. Thanks very much and looking forward to next time.